okay so uh, everyone you can join the no mic chat which is right above the event stage and you can talk there if you can't open your mic and if you want to discuss anything ask anything so we'll be starting now uh, cosmo guru are, are you there please yes i'm here okay so let's start okay let's um do you, how do you want to you want me to give an introduction or uh, i'll introduce you and then we'll go ahead with it okay yeah everyone welcome tonight uh, tonight we have dr narayan prasad uh, he is a he is a co-founder at satsurf a global marketplace for space supported uh, for space logistics and services and is, this startup is incubated by the european space agency and currently it has thousands of global users all over the world and has helped more than 2000 suppliers connect to the buyers directly worldwide he has also partnered with the government of kerala in the past to help with the development of a space economic hub in india he has to his name he has earned three master degrees in fields such as space science and technology space telecommunication laws and astrophysics and then he went ahead with a uh, dad PhD scholarship, which is offered by the German government, which he completed in the field of supply chain management and logistics. He is also curator at New Space India and heads India's first space-focused podcast, New Space India podcast. So, <clears throat> let's start, um, sir. So, to kick things off, can you tell the audience about your journey thus far and about how you went from a mechanical engineer to a doctoral degree in supply chain management? with uh, other degrees in the field of space and astronomy sure absolutely i mean it's uh, nothing was planned i would say in my career almost uh, in fact um, i it was uh, even accidental that i became uh, a space engineer uh, because you know i grew up in a pretty middle class uh, south indian family uh, where uh, i did not really have any dreams of uh, you know becoming an astronaut or an astrophysicist or a space engineer or any of these kinds and i was just lucky to find some friends who were excited about building airplanes and you know building satellites and i just uh, got hooked to uh, working with them and eventually found that i liked uh, doing uh, satellites and space um so yeah i mean i dabbled around uh, building gliders uh, with friends of mine uh, building you know micro air vehicles uh, building you know satellite structures things like that in my early undergraduate days and uh, that really helped me notice what i really like and i decided that i actually like the space sector a little bit more than the aviation side so a few friends of mine uh, went on to do things like uh, wing design and other things uh, eventually as scientists and i ended up uh, i think i'm the only one who ended up in the space side of things so yeah i mean that opened up uh, doors to uh, since i had uh, quite a lot of uh, experience already in some of the things that uh, was hands on uh, with uh, the space side i managed to get a, a scholarship to study in uh, you know a very interesting european union program where you couldn't go and study in uh, three different or four different countries so you tend to spend 6 months in one country and i got to spend time in germany sweden and france uh, where i actually spent 6 months each uh, in uh, an erasmus mundus program so if any of you are looking for such uh, opportunities where you want to go study abroad and especially in europe in a very uh, in a setting where it's completely free uh, erasmus mundus pays students to you know basically go travel and uh, study in these different countries so there is no real uh, if you manage to get the scholarship then you don't need to have to pay for anything and they will in fact pay you a monthly scholarship and also expenses to move to europe as a student and things like that so uh, yeah i was quite lucky in doing all of this so that uh, you know led me into finishing my uh, master degrees and the speciality of the erasmus is that uh, you can actually end up getting two master degrees uh, in two years from two different countries so i got mine from uh, Uh, Sweden and then one from France uh, where I studied both uh, space instrumentation and space technology. So yeah, I mean eventually I ended up uh, back in India in 2012 where I started my first company uh, called Dhruva Space. I don't know maybe some of you already know this company. Uh, there's about 30 people now in Hyderabad working there. 
uh, we started off as one of the earliest new space companies in india uh, in and around uh, i think only maybe team indus and uh, and earth to orbit were two other companies that were around at that time uh, you today you know there's lots of companies including like skyroot agnikol pixel and others so yeah you know basically i ran that for 5 years and i went back to germany uh, because the ecosystem here was not really mature for it investment and uh, customers and things like that so i got a little bit frustrated uh, with uh, what was happening here and i left back to europe and uh, the best way to go back was to get a phd because uh, you know again i didn't have a lot of money saved for example that i could go back and start a, a company again so i thought okay let me start a company again and uh, in parallel do a phd because i can uh, live off of my phd stipend so i ended up getting a, a dad scholarship uh, basically to uh, do a phd and uh, you know my bet was that i could build uh, our startup again uh, ground up over and if i managed to get enough customers in like two and a half three years i can uh, you know safely finish my phd and at the same time uh, you know step into becoming a full time entrepreneur again so sat search was uh, you know built on that idea that in 3 years we should find enough customers to pay ourselves enough uh, salaries like at the european half. level and uh, you know thankfully we achieved that so uh, just about the time that i was finishing my phd we had enough customers to live off of uh, customer money so uh, we built that search as a very ground up uh, organically grown business so we don't really have any external investors or so on so today we have uh, customers in 25 countries um and we have colleagues who are working out of five different countries at this point of time so yeah so that's more or less you know the journey so far and uh yeah i mean it's just uh, i would say taking risk uh, with a reasonably uh, you know good reward that you can get off of it and uh, just keeping the mindset of you know what you can achieve with very little resources that you can have already so i'm sure that uh, this is the same for a lot of you here as well and that's a pretty pretty interesting and inspiration take on it and uh, really personally i am a when i was searching about you searching about you i am a very huge fan of the the perseverance and patience of studying this much and then founding the companies and then yep. doing all this hard work so you are at the chief chief operations officer ceo at satsets right Correct. Correct. So, uh, what are the well, so you already told us about search search, but what are the logistical challenges faced by a company like this? Because it's a like a space service provider company, right? You connect people who want services to the people who are offering services. So, what what are the challenges that you faced in the early years of the company? Sure. So, uh, you know, the problem uh, in the space sector is that, uh, you know, until recently, last uh, 10 years or so, there were not many countries that were doing space. In fact, you know, even a country like India was an aberration. Um, and, you know, if you look at India's own neighborhood, for example, uh, Sri Lanka or Bhutan or Nepal or all of these countries have started to do space in the last, you know, five to 10 years. and that's just because uh, the cost of access to space because of people like spacex and you know cost of microelectronics and miniaturization have all uh, come down because of the cubesat phenomena and others so there's a lot of interest from even developing countries so uh, for us you know we are trying is trying to solve uh, two sets of problems basically uh, one is um, yeah, for example if you are a uh, engineer that is sitting out of a country like bhutan for example you know we work with some of their engineers um, you have no prior experience uh, of working in the space sector because you know your country is doing something in the space sector for the first time so how do you actually you know get to know who are suppliers in this industry what kind of components exist what kind of uh, you know electronics exists what kind of services exists that you can actually use uh, to build a mission for your own country for example right so because at the end of the day you don't have any for example local suppliers within bhutan for example who are able to provide something locally for them or even if they exist they'll be they can provide maybe some very specific thing not everything right so 
uh, for us, you know, that's an interesting basket case where essentially we want to help such engineers uh, to find, you know, suppliers, product services, components, everything else that they want to figure out that, um, you know, earlier before us, uh, these engineers were basically forced to either Google all this information by themselves and collect all of this information by having a spreadsheet and, you know, going through everything. And uh, the idea was that, you know, we were building such search for our, ourselves because we as space engineers have done this also quite a lot of times. And uh, we were also frustrated that there was no single, you know, centralized resource that uh, we could use to basically say, I want to basically search for, let's say, a GPS receiver that we can fly on a satellite. And if I want to know, like, you know, 10 suppliers that are producing it, uh, I want to know that in less than a minute. Uh, we wanted to build something some uh, like that, right? So we built it, and you know, basically today we have uh, over twelve thousand users uh, from a hundred plus countries. Uh, basically, more or less engineers who use us uh, in different uh, mission analysis and mission design uh, for their own missions, for example. And so, obviously, you know, we really can't expect. Uh, uh, these engineers to really pay us because, uh, you know, that's the user side. So one of the things that we had to figure out is uh, how do we actually get paid? Uh, because obviously engineers who are using this platform at their desk may not have the budget to pay it for themselves or we really can't expect, uh, you know, engineers to really pay for such a service. So we had to come up with a business model that actually works and uh, the immediate... Uh, thing that we looked at is uh, who are we actually creating value for and for us it was very clear that the value that we are creating for are for suppliers in this industry and you know it's a very simple analogy where if for example uh, you know uh, flipkart and amazon came into india and they digitized uh, you know shops for many small vendors uh, to get access to consumers uh, in that setting where consumers can click on their products in the shop that uh, you know Amazon and Flipkart has built for these uh, small uh, sellers uh, that's the same thing that we do basically but we do it for uh, space engineers to connect with suppliers and so suppliers have a supplier hub that we have on chat search and basically engineers can talk to these suppliers and essentially you know we have created a a marketing and a, and a sales uh, channel for space industry suppliers to, to use us as one of the channels that they can acquire customers from. So essentially, we've uh, you know engineered such as to be a, a SaaS business, uh, basically where um, you know suppliers uh, get a steady stream of traffic and and leads from our platform, and they can actually uh, use that to acquire new customers. So, for example, if uh, you know, German SME is uh, working on a specific niche uh, on, let's say, some kind of a RF system or a, or a GPS system or something like that. And it's very hard for such a small company of 15 or 20 people to reach out to, let's say, customers in Thailand or Indonesia or other places. And that's the gap that we kind of bridge uh, where we actually help these small companies. And, you know, most often it's the small companies that uh, use us a lot at the end and we help them get customers from uh, you know different parts of the world and that's how you know we monetize uh, such search today uh, that's very insightful uh, that's very insightful actually okay sir i had a question like what are your thoughts on the idea of nasa converting a moon crater into a telescope like does it make sense in technical terms or do you think we have that kind of devices right now what would we need we should just try it making with basic principles like we do on Earth or come up with a new perspective altogether, like in a different way. Yeah, I mean, the uh, the possibilities are endless when it comes to, you know, using instruments in different places and putting them across. You know, it's always a question of um, what is the budget available for these kinds of uh, projects, you know, because... Um, you know, scientists always come up with very interesting ideas on how uh, astrophysics and knowledge about space science can increase over time. You know, just look at what is happening with the James Webb Space Telescope. I think uh, that's a 25-year project. 
Yes, so, yes. Uh, yes. right. So typically you enter there as a project manager or something like that. And, you know, in such a large uh, project, you end up your career uh, seeing one large project uh, fly at the end of your career. Right. So and it's it costs quite a lot of money and it costs quite a lot of resources. It takes a, a lot of time. So it's a question of, uh, you know, our uh, countries uh, willing to fund projects like that. Uh, it's it's not even you know in in the technology perspective, right? So even if you take something like uh, the JWST, uh, it has uh, a tremendous amount of uh, engineering challenges. So they have this uh, shield where the telescope should be shielded from the sun all the time, and you know the temperatures must be very low so that you can pick up uh, you know all the signal and uh, and measure all the science data and and so on, right? So and you have to have a foldable structure because you know though that particular telescope doesn't really fit in any rocket for the size of the telescope. So they have to have like this origami setup where the entire telescope is folded and then you have to unfold it. You have to make sure that the temperature on the other side is cooled down and it has no stray light from the uh, sun within our solar system and, and so many other technical challenges, right? So uh, essentially, even if you want to do something on the moon, for example, it's uh, more or less the same. There are a wide array of challenges, basically transportation to the surface of the moon and then assembly and integration and uh, is, is a very, very big, big challenge. So... Um, I mean, something like that would possibly cost maybe, you know, five times more as the JWST itself, minimum, that is. So the question always is about, you know, is uh, even NASA, for example, willing to fund a project like that? And uh, it was easier to convince politicians to fund projects like that uh, in the Apollo era than uh, what it is today. So, you know, just to kind of give you a sense, I think the Apollo era had like four or five percent of uh, US's GDP going to NASA. Today, it's like uh, nowhere close to that. So uh, it's like 0.2 percent or something like that. It's ridiculously low, you know, when it comes to uh, those numbers, right? So until and unless we actually spend uh, a lot more money, uh, those kinds of large projects uh, may be very difficult to do. It's the same with a country like India as well, because today we spend, uh, you know, uh, a fraction of our GDP on anything space science. And if India has to do uh, very serious space science, it needs a lot more money uh, to be pulled uh, put into space. And uh, even uh, ISRO's budget for an entire year is something like 10,000 crores. Right? 10,000 crores is, uh, you know, if you look at uh, a project like Curiosity, it's uh, the cost of one project like that. So, yeah, so this is always the challenge. So I'm sure that uh, there's a tremendous amount of interest even within India for such projects. Uh, the question always is about, you know, are we willing to fund such uh, projects? Well, the, the pros outweighs the cons in this case, right? Because the James Webb Telescope will give a much bigger and clearer look and even the <clears throat> older understanding of the universe because it's and about the lunar Lunar Crater Telescope, Lunar Crater Radio Telescope project, uh, it essentially removes the atmosphere, right, sir? Uh, uh, yeah. Am I saying it wrong? It yeah, yeah, that's that. correct. Yeah, it, yeah. it removes the interference, and then uh, we can have a clearer image of whatever we're trying to locate. Yeah, absolutely. So, in fact, you know, what is a good framework to think about this is, um, you know, looking at uh, anything science uh, can, has to be looked at from a 25-year perspective. So, you know, if you are investing in a project like that, it's not about the construction, it's also about the science. So you, you see that even, even though Hubble is so old, you see even today people are doing PhDs on the data that the Hubble is collecting. Uh, so uh, yeah, the problem in that is that, you know, most people think in short terms and uh, funding cycle happens a lot in short terms. So you need to have people to you know think in longer terms in 20, 25 year round terms to really invest in such uh, in such projects because uh, at the end of the day the science and the engineering outcomes of all of that and how society will benefit from all of that data and all of that engineer engineering will uh, take quite some time right so we need to kind of have patience and most often policymakers you know don't have that kind of patience. Well, it's the same thing. Politicians don't have patience and they, they just want immediate results and they don't think in a sustainable and long-term goal point of view. 
it's the same with the international space station and i i was going to ask you about it so so recently we saw china build their own space station and assembled in the orbit and they pulled out of the international space station program and now it's going to be shut down in 2024 so what do you think uh, having multiple space stations for different countries is more beneficial than having one collaborated international space station that right that we already have right now and so what are your opinions on this right so unfortunately this goes uh, a little bit into more of the geopolitics you know geopolitical scenario around the world um in fact china was i think never invited to be the, a part of the international space station at all uh so they have had their plans of doing their own station uh, at the end because of all of that i suppose um and yeah i mean uh, at the end of the day today i think uh, the mindset is changing you know the international space station is i think already like maybe around 30 years in construction uh, although they keep constructing or maintaining it uh, over and over um so yeah i mean the technology there is very very old and in fact today i think uh, the strategy by the us is changing towards commercial companies doing it so if some of you know a company called axiom space uh, which is a us private company uh, and in fact you know they have plans of taking over the um you know space station modules uh, systematically and eventually they want to have uh, you know when the space station the iss retires they want to have their own private space station that they will operate and you know people like nasa will possibly use that uh, and pay them to conduct experiments instead of uh, nasa actually paying uh, you know subcontractors to build space stations for nasa for example right so it's a very different thinking than other countries like india or china or russia where uh, you know when it comes comes to a space station itself uh, you expect uh, you know an agency like isro or in china's case the uh, cnsa to build and operate it right so um, yeah i mean it's also a question of uh, soft power you know it's like india sending a a rover to the moon or a, a probe to mars or so on right it's a, a question of soft power and uh, you know for some of you who who are interested in stuff like geopolitics uh, there's something called uh, you know like uh, uh great power uh you know theory for example where basically if you are supposed to be a, let's say a great power in this world uh, uh you're supposed to do certain things and space is one of the aspects that people look at as uh, great powers and that's why you know india also chooses to do its own space station rather than join like a uh, a side project like the iss for example where india just becomes a collaborator because you know you expect a country like india to be a great powers and do its own thing right so then rather than just join uh, another project uh, that's led by other countries so yeah so this is you know some of the reasons why uh, this happens but uh, but it will be very interesting to see what will happen in the next 5 uh, or 10 years because uh, especially with the commercial uh, you know space take space station ecosystem taking up, uh, on it will be interesting to see if commercial players actually do something uh, very interesting there for example uh, there are there are companies that are looking to manufacture things in microgravity uh, so for example you know there's this company called made in space that is looking to manufacture some very interesting fibers that can only be manufactured in microgravity or you have better performance of those materials being manufactured in microgravity there's uh, you know some pharmaceutical companies and biotechnology companies that are looking to do interesting and innovative experiments in uh, microgravity environments where you know possibly enzymes or uh, uh, bacteria or you know any other such uh, biological stuff uh, you know acts differently than uh, on the ground so they're hoping that you know some of this research will lead to them discovering the fact that uh, producing some of those kinds of pharmaceutical uh, chemical processes in space will actually yield uh, better results for them and they can bring it back to earth and you know do something about it uh, there's also you know companies that are looking at uh, interesting new areas like wine so there's a company in uh, in france uh, that is looking at uh, sending wine into space and then maturing wine in space and then bringing back that uh, to the earth and to sell it to some very niche 
uh, you know, consumers, right? So uh, their theory is that, you know, the wine, uh, the maturity of wine in microgravity conditions may be uh, different. The way it matures may be slightly different than, uh, you know, that being done on the ground. So uh, these are all, you know, some of the very interesting developments that are happening today. And we might as well find ourselves uh, where people have figured out in the next uh, few years that, uh, you know, manufacturing something in the space environment uh, actually makes the product really competitive. And uh, with that, they can take that back and, you know, bring that back here on the ground and they can try to find some uh, businesses or consumers that can actually use it and, uh, you know, build a business on top of it. So that would be super interesting to see. Yes, uh, it's pretty nice and interesting, exciting at this stage where in this decade, we have seen so many private players coming into this field and the recent launches and space flights that we, that has been happening by all these uh, Virgin Atlantic and SpaceX. And well, we have seen so many private players and companies coming to the field, trying to privatize it, commercialize it. And they have loads and loads of funding. Like you mentioned, Axiom, they have a contract for hundreds of millions of dollars for, for buying the ISS module. So what do you think? Uh, what is the most major change that will happen with this privatization of this previously uh, government-funded field? Right. So uh, the thing is, it's all about, uh, you know, opportunity, right? So you have today um, a lot of convergence in different sectors uh, that are being uh, used in space. So just as an example, right, you look like uh, you look at a company like Amazon, Right. So Amazon has Amazon Web Services. You know, many of you might know about their cloud strategy. And, you know, today their cloud strategy is extending to space. Even Microsoft, for example, has an Azure space team that is selling uh, cloud based uh, solutions for space companies. Right. And at the same time, you know, you look at uh, what are the opportunities like. So, you know, if you take a country like India, for example, uh, you go to even the rural areas. Uh, you know, broadband connectivity is not a, a big thing, even in rural India, even today, right? So today you have companies like SpaceX with Starlink or Airtel with OneWeb who have invested in all of this to connect those people, right? So look at uh, what are the effects of uh, that when people in that particular uh, segment come live onto the internet. You know, today we are using Discord, right? So, and you need a certain level of connectivity to actually be there. And in this case, you know, of course, having even a 3G network or a 2G or a 4G network might work. But if you want to watch, I don't know, Netflix in very high definition, 4K or something like that, you still need a broadband connection for all of that, right? So, um, and so if, for example, we have, uh, let's say, uh, 250 million people in India who fit that segment where they don't have access to broadband connectivity and can't watch, you know, anything like Netflix or YouTube or anything like that, right? So, uh, and if we bring them live to the, uh, to, you know, the internet with that connectivity layer in place, look at what what can happen. And I mean, the typical example is look at uh, what has happened with uh, a company like Geo bringing, uh, you know, connectivity to millions of people here in India with their uh, network, the traditional telecommunication network. So it's all about, you know, uh, which uh, new markets are being opened up. So clearly, you know, broadband is something that people are experimenting with and, you know, people want to provide uh, space-based broadband connectivity to rural areas or, you know, for example, you know, I would love to work uh, on my flight between uh, Bangalore and Delhi, which is like two and a half hours and be productive, right? So today there's not really a very productive way of, uh, you know, being engaged with work uh, on those flights because you don't really have, you know, in-flight connectivity and you don't really have high-speed broadband on that flight for two and a half hours and you're just uh, sitting there waiting to get to Delhi, right? So, I mean, in the near future, you'll have a, a player who will come up and say, I'm, I'm going to provide you uh, as an add-on to your flight ticket. Uh, give me whatever, so 500 rupees extra and I'm going to give you uh, internet connectivity while you are uh, you know, sitting in that flight between Bangalore and Delhi. And you can actually answer your emails and, you know, do whatever you want with the internet, right? So, uh, and that's the kind of the value add because uh, you look at uh, these kinds of opportunities and these are uh, commercial opportunities that are out there. So people are going to be doing this, uh, you know, let's look at uh, what can be done with satellite imagery. So you look at, uh, you know, how farmers uh, access credit in this country for, uh, you know, taking loans from uh, banks, 
uh, for their own crops, right? So today, it's still a large portion of uh, farmers in this country, they have uh, no access to banks when it comes to loans. Um, you know, and, and they take uh, a lot of borrowing from uh, landlords or, you know, uh, at very high interest rates, right? So one of the things that stops banks from giving loans to farmers uh, in very small settings is that, uh, you know, banks don't really have any digitized data on farmers. So, you know, when you and I take a education loan or, you know, home loan or something like that, uh, you know, there's a lot of data that says, uh, what is your credit worthiness? Uh, right. And essentially, uh, that is not really well established for farmers because, uh, you know, farmers, uh, banks don't know if farmers will use that money for farming itself or will they use it to, you know, for example, pay the money off for, uh, you know, uh, a child that they want to get married uh, during the time or, you know, uh, if their land is really productive and they will get uh, uh, the harvest in a, in a, in the right fashion or so. So there's a, a massive opportunity where, you know, companies are today solving problems where banks can get to know uh, how productive the land was uh, for the last, you know, seven or eight years using satellite imagery. And, you know, when a farmer comes, uh, they can collect the GPS coordinates by asking the farmer the address of the land. And, you know, they can look up the history of that land by, uh, you know, looking at uh, how productive that land was for the last seven or eight years. And then look at, you know, how much is the yield of that uh, land and then, uh, you know, what is the threat that the land has from climate change and other places, other things. And, you know, basically then they can create a risk model, right? So where basically with, with that risk model, the bank can actually say that, uh, you know, the this particular farmer is less risky when it comes to me being able to give that uh, uh, loan to him and, uh, you know, some other farmer saying this is a very risky business because the land has not been very productive or so on, right? So, uh, and uh, and they can also monitor if the farm is the farmer is growing uh, stuff and, and, um, and if the land is productive and if the yields are reasonable for them to, for them to kind of get back money. So these are, you know, some of the very interesting use cases. There are hundreds of these use cases. So if some of you are really interested in becoming uh, space entrepreneurs, you could look at, uh, you know, what kind of use cases can you solve based on your experience or, you know, your family's experience or, you know, problems that you see in the society where basically, you know, satellite-based connectivity or satellite-based uh, position or, you know, satellite-based uh, imaging or video or things like that uh, can help in uh, solving problems in the society. So it's all about, uh, you know, modernizing society. Uh, and uh, modernizing society as a part of uh, using uh, space. And, you know, no one cares, you know, where the antennas are when it comes to 4G, right? So you and I just uh, basically switch on our phone and uh, switch on our, four, you know, mobile data, and we expect uh, whatever, 50 Mbps connections to be around. And uh, that's the sort of service we look for. And we don't really care who uh, puts the towers and where the towers are put and, uh, you know, how the, to the towers are maintained. We just expect that service to be provided at the cost that we are paying these companies, right? And that's how, you know, we should be thinking about space as well. That satellites are just there, you know, they're doing their thing. And, uh, you know, consumers and businesses don't need to, don't need to really care where uh, this particular data or connectivity is coming from. But essentially, you know, they're getting a service from all of this that uh, is useful for them. Yes, uh, about the, the fact you said the satellites being used by uh, banks or some other crediting, uh, crediting organization. I remember last year around September, around this time, there was this news article about, uh, I am guess I'm, I don't, I'm not completely sure I'm guessing here. It was ICICI bank. And they were using satellite system to check the thing that you told us, the viability of the land that the farmers are actually creating loans on. So when I read it, it was very exciting and reading it was like, actually we are progressing in this field and there is something very, a big opportunity in this field. And well, you clearly, clearly explained it and, and it was very nice. Chijan, uh, over to you now. Yeah. So like you started in this uh, space industry uh, initially, what was something or something that you learned afterwards that you wished you uh, would have known before or somebody would have told you, like one piece of advice you would like to give to someone starting out in this field, this industry? 
Right. So I would say that the mistake uh, that I possibly did is, um, you know, I actually did not, uh, you know, work anywhere before. So uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, I struggled with is to understand this industry uh, ground up and, you know, having to make all the connections in my mind and, uh, you know, straight out of university after finishing my um, uh, my master's, I actually started off a company, right? So it was actually very difficult uh, because, you know, in this industry, you need kind of credibility, you need, uh, uh, you know, some amount of experience, you need uh, some amount of connections uh, and, and so on, right? So, uh, so that you can then, uh, you know, jump into identifying what kind of problem you are solving and, uh, you know, get that sense of, uh, you know, knowing people where you, who you can go try to sell to at the end, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I think if uh, some of you are really starting out in this industry, it's, uh, you know, space industry industries to begin companies in. Normally, you know, companies take seven to 10 years to mature, unlike, you know, traditional software uh, companies, right? So in this industry, you have to spend anywhere between seven and 10 years to really get any sort of credibility uh, as a... Uh, as a reputable, you know, company at the end. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I wish somebody had come up and t told me that, uh, you know, you better work for some uh, someone, uh, maybe another startup as an employee or something like that, uh, and get a sense of what is this industry like, you know, what are the challenges like, uh, you, know, you know, what problems do the companies really face in, in the process of building uh, innovative new products and, you know, get that base and get that security in place. Uh, before you actually, you know, go ahead and try to do something on your own. But of course, you know, if you have uh, uh, the uh, the ability to take that sort of a risk, uh, you know, then go ahead regardless. But uh, but for me personally, I thought that was uh, at that point of time, at least when I was starting my first company, it would have been uh, maybe more, uh, you know, useful if I had actually worked. That was pretty uh, pretty nice, and uh, I hope all the people listening here, uh, get, it's, it helps at least one person. And uh, over season, over to you again. Yeah, yeah. So I would like to ask, what do you think about Starlink? Like its viability, and uh, you know, in the future, there might be a potential problem of increased space debris in Earth's orbit, which can pose a problem to the space industry as of right now. Yeah, so uh, there are two or three main thoughts there. So one is, uh, of course, you know, uh, price points. Uh, Starlink uh, in the US is being sold at uh, $500 for the antenna. That's the one-time antenna cost. Uh, there's, uh, they are charging US consumers, uh, I think, $99 a month for their service. So, you know, convert that to Indian rupees, it's uh, what's something like... 35,000 Indian uh, rupees for an antenna uh, and, uh, you know, whatever, 7,000 rupees per month for yes. the actual connection, right? So I'm not really sure how many Indians can actually afford that service uh, in that fashion, right? So it doesn't really mean that uh, it won't work. Uh, they may have a, a different strategy when it comes to India and how they will price it here and, you know, how the connectivity will be provided. You know, uh, maybe they have a way of... Uh, you know, providing uh, connectivity at uh, a village level, for example, where, uh, you know, a few hundred people connect to the network or uh, through uh, through some architecture. And then, you know, the, the price for the bandwidth uh, actually reduces uh, because of that. And you can have one antenna with the other, you know, modems that are really connected so that the price gets uh, distributed as well. Um, so, yeah, so that would be an interesting thing to see as to how they will localize. Uh, to make sure that they are entering the Indian market and they can actually, you know, provide a service here. Uh, that'll be very interesting to see in the upcoming years. As far as, uh, you know, space traffic management is concerned, uh, I mean, there is debate uh, nowadays, you know, in uh, the global policy circles as to what should be done about it. Uh, and, you know, companies like SpaceX are looking to deorbit their satellites, so bring it back to the atmosphere and burn the satellites up but even if they are dead you know they and they you know die because of uncontrolled reasons for example which often happens in the space sector uh, there are people who are trying to build uh, you know services that will uh, capture dead satellites and can bring them back or push them back to the earth uh, earth's atmosphere so they can burn up 
right? So those are something that are being built as well. And the question is, you know, are companies willing to pay for such a service, right? So, and there are, you know, there's another company which is based in Bangalore itself called Digantara, who is uh, building a very interesting service of uh, monitoring space traffic. So they want to monitor, I think, objects uh, of the size of even one centimeter. And um, essentially, you know, that will allow spacecraft operators. It's like building a radar on the ground to monitor air traffic so that uh, air traffic controllers can know where the aircrafts are. And, you know, you don't you are coordinating with pilots uh, so that, uh, you know, aircrafts don't uh, crash into each other. And you also are, you know, maybe have built a an automatic system where uh, you know uh, people know each other's uh, satellites or aircrafts for example and you know they know when somebody has to go up and another person has to go down for example right so these are all uh, some of the technologies and initiatives that are being experimented in the space domain and uh, you know it, this was a challenge even in the aviation domain right as the number of aircrafts increased in the sky people thought two aircrafts can never crash into each other because the sky is so huge right but it didn't happen many times so, and then there was coordination needed uh, so that it doesn't repeat again. And uh, that's what, you know, technology does, right? It, uh, once you see a problem, you kind of go ahead and solve it. And that's what, you know, people are trying to do today with the satellites as well. I'm sure that, you know, in the next few years, uh, there will be a, a kind of a system in place where uh, people know how to operate satellites and, you know, if they want to move their satellites if other objects are coming in their way or, you know, removing their dead satellites and all of this, I think, I'm sure... Uh, will come up in the next few years. Yes. Uh, yep, I hope that answered your question, Srijan. Uh, since yeah, it's, yeah. Been, uh, it's been 45 minutes, you have started. Uh, everyone in the chat and everyone on the stage right now in the audience, if you guys have any questions for uh, Cosmo Guru, Sir Narayan, you can ask, you can raise your hand and we'll invite you to the stage and you can ask him. or. Alternatively, you can put it in the no mic chat and then either of us, me or Shizan, will ask it to him and then he'll be addressing to you. Uh, so the last question from my side for you uh, tonight, sir, is it's about the Indian space industry and the current scenario that's been happening here. So what, what are your opinions about it and what are some steps that you would like to suggest? Uh, obviously, like uh, you would like to suggest that could uh, help in the advancement of space technology in India. Like we saw ISRO is working very hard towards the moon landings and the Mars rover. And it's it's a very, very, like very pivotal point of time in the Indian space industry and its history right now. So what, what are your views on it? Right, so, you know, in the last uh, five or six years, we've seen about 50 new companies come up. Uh, you know, earlier, about 10 years ago, you could not raise any venture capital as a space company in India, for example, right? So we have actually solved that problem of getting access to venture capital where you can go if you have an innovative new product in space and you can go raise that capital. And, you know, uh, for, 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 for us, I think, you know, the one of the main things that we are looking at is, uh, you know, how can we actually bring... Uh, a lot more companies in into India and uh, get this uh, rolling, right? So 50 companies uh, in India are very little compared to other ecosystems. Like, you know, in the US, you have like 3,000 startups in the space sector uh, that are trying to do different things. So there are many problems that, uh, you know, companies in India can solve, you know, company problems like uh, monitoring, you know, air quality, water quality, uh, land use, you know, minerals, uh, uh, fisheries, you know, so many use cases are there in India where you can build applications uh, for that and you can build companies on top of it. So I'm, I think, you know, more bullish about uh, people coming up with ideas that will uh, solve problems in these sectors. Uh, and then, you know, uh, young people will figure out how they can use space and satellites in terms of uh, solving some of these major challenges in, in Indian cities and Indian villages, for example. And then, you know, you can then use that price to performance. Uh, you know, once you solve such a problem, you can easily take that to many other countries, right? You can take it to Southeast Asia or you can take it to Africa. And the price to performance and the problem sets may be very similar to that in India, right? So those are all uh, very interesting opportunities. And, you know, uh, we want to see, you know, uh, all, you, all you guys, you know, some of you guys also start companies, for example, and hopefully uh, we'll have, uh, you know, 
the next hundred companies come up in the next uh, five years or so? Yes, uh, Srijan, I think you can head the discussion from here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So who would, who's, who's going first? Like, Tavni, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Srijan and Rocha. And hello, Narayan sir, I hope you remember me. And my question is, like, what inspired you to make New Space India podcast? Oh, thank you very much. I do remember, uh, you know, chatting with you. Um, uh, I mean, the podcast is very simple. So, you know, in India, we don't have, uh, uh, like NASA has, for example, NASA has an audio history project. Uh, when the Apollo astronauts went to the moon and they came back, uh, one of the things that the NASA guys did is, you know, they have an established uh, uh, history uh, division within NASA. And, you know, they actually uh, captured the thoughts of a lot of these astronauts. They recorded a lot of their experiences. You know, they put it out in the public domain. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons I started the podcast was that uh, uh, I started thinking about the space industry, uh, you know, 15 years ago. And one of the things that I saw that was missing is uh, 15 years ago, there was actually no resources to talk about, you know, how was this industry actually built in India? How, who, which scientist helped, uh, you know, doing what, what did we actually, uh, you know, do in the last 50 years? So a lot of that information uh, was actually missing in context. And uh, I saw that, you know, around me, there were a lot of people who were uh, involved in all of these activities, either through ISRO or through, you know, the industry, right? So, you know, I thought that um, if since nobody had created this sort of a resource that, uh, you know, I should probably do it so that uh, young people in the future can kind of benefit by listening to some of these uh, people. And, you know, these are a lot of uh, inspiring people, right? Because uh, a lot of the guests that I have are sometimes over 70 years old or 80 years old in many in some cases as well. And, you know, they would have contributed to development of the space ecosystem in India you know, during the 60s or during the 70s. And, you know, they, they will never, unfortunately, not live, uh, you know, for long enough uh, for many generations to again interact with them. And so by capturing some of their voices, uh, it's always interesting to hear the story of what were the challenges of working during their time, uh, which is very different than, you know, what are we talking, you know, today, for example, right? So, yeah, so this is one of the reasons, uh, you know, just to make it kind of open for everyone and uh, uh, just to give some context to people who are especially passionate about the space industry to, you know, listen and get some context. Um, yes, sir, totally agree with your words. And we really need such information to make students aware about it. And thanks to your podcast, I got to know about the Indian private sector. So guys, uh, do check out his podcast, which is available on Spotify. And also check our astronomy channel, where we uh, talk about uh, all this stuff. So, so my second question is, like, in our server, most of the people are in college or, like, have appeared for JE Advance recently. And, yes, high school students. So if one wants to pursue space science in, uh, what can you say? in detail or like with great passion uh, is india a good option because there are like very few colleges for aerospace engineering like ist and iisc so should one think of abroad for studying space science um yeah i mean uh, it really depends right you know there's uh, only so many places in iist and iits and other places right i don't come from any of these uh, elite uh, institutions by myself for example right so i guess it's about um, you know if you're good enough to get to those places then you know uh, you're very very good of course to to be able to get into those places but i also don't want to disappoint uh, other people who may not be able to you know ace these entrance exams given the competition that there is today uh, um, yeah, I mean, I am a very strong believer in uh, project-oriented learning, no matter which uh, city and village you are in today. The internet and, uh, you know, cost of electronics is a very, big, very, very big leveler. Even if you are, you know, in a third tier city in India today, you still have the internet and you can still learn a lot of things. You can still do a lot of projects by, uh, by being involved. So I would say, you know, for me, during my career as well, um, doing something hands-on in a team environment even at uh, high school or university was the best thing that i could do 
because uh, that's one way of knowing how do you actually work with other people uh, in a difficult setting um, and you know how do you actually uh, bring projects that you are dreaming about to kind of reality instead of uh, you know just kind of acing uh, theoretical exams right so uh, be it in astronomy or you know in uh, space science or uh, in uh, in avionics or uh, rocketry or you know satellites Uh, there are possibilities for each one of you to do something hands on today either in uh, hardware or in software uh, or in experiments right so uh, the question is you know are you uh, willing to take that step uh, where you will actually uh, unfortunately there may be no incentive for you to do it right because uh, there will be no uh, you know uh, teacher or a professor or a university that will give you marks and uh, grades for doing any of this because uh, most often all of these projects are uh, not a part of uh, curriculum in any university for that matter and uh, doing interesting projects uh, will have to be it has to come from your own interest and uh, your own uh, effort and you will have to take the chance of you know doing something where uh, you might learn a lot but you might not actually not benefit uh, of getting any grades on top of it but i think you know that's the sort of experience that actually helps uh, in the future because um, uh, even you know we recruit a lot of people in our company as well so one of the things that we look at is uh, you know what are the hands on projects that people have done and you know what kind of experience that they have uh, to be very honest with you we actually don't care about which university people have studied in and uh, what are their grades we never ask for people to show their uh, report cards or you know uh, whatever mark sheets or things like that so we really about we really ask them about you know whatever what have they actually done uh, as projects and what problems they have solved Uh, while doing those projects and uh, basically i'm a very very strong believer in uh, project oriented learning and uh, you know i hope uh, some of you can take that route regardless of which university that you study in well uh, that was a really nice answer sir chavani i think we should move on to other people that are waiting abiram yes yes you you and your get yes, chavani um sure archa thank you sir abiram are you there you can ask a question now yes yes sir so hello sir uh, basically i am a, a business student i am currently pursuing my third year uh, in business undergraduate so uh, i've heard all, all of that you have told throughout the session and i, I don't say I, i i was able to understand everything that you said so in simple terms what i would like to ask is coming from a business background with very less technical uh knowledge especially in space how could i build a career or how could i build a business in the field of space so uh what uh when i think of space and uh building a business uh in those terms in in the in the terms of space the first thought that i would get in my mind is simply building satellites because that is what i would usually hear on the internet or elsewhere so what other services or what other business ideas that i could look up uh, look into rather than simply building uh, satellites or uh, something that is more general in nature sure um just as a note uh, you know although i have done lots of engineering work and uh, you know also some amount of managerial work uh, unfortunately today <laughs> uh, or fortunately or unfortunately i'm actually heading sales at my company uh i overlook all the sales teams and uh, basically uh, you know look at uh, how do you keep people from 25 countries happy at this point of time so in the area of space you know unfortunately you need uh, some level of uh, technical knowledge to even do sales uh, because you know at the end of the day uh, you need to kind of answer some technical questions when it comes to the fit to a particular product so for example you know if uh, you say that uh, you know some customer wants a particular image of a particular area you should be able to know for example what are cameras capable of to be you know to image from space and what would be the cost of it uh, and so on right so you need some amount of physics and basics uh, for even doing sales in this uh, industry right so uh, so yeah so you can't really escape that and uh, you know most people who are from the sales background end up learning about uh, some of the technical uh things although not very deeply at the engineering level but at least at the technical level they do learn uh, quite a lot uh you know sales is not just about uh, selling satellites right so uh you know there are people who are for example uh, 
setting up uh, VSAT terminals. You know, these are, uh, many of you may not know, for example, but uh, banks uh, in India, for example, are uh, powered by satellites. So most banks, uh, for example, uh, the ATMs where you can go and, you know, put your card, credit card or debit card and you withdraw money, the back end of that uh, ATM, for example, is connected to a, a very small aperture terminal, which is a VSAT. Uh, it's an antenna that connects to a satellite. Uh, and that link is what, you know, uh, connects with the bank servers. And then, you know, they are then, um, you know, talking to the bank server to check your account balance before you get the money. But unfortunately, most most of uh, you may not know for that, uh, you know, uh, a bank ATM is connected to a satellite, right? So uh, this is the sort of, uh, you know, the gap that we have, right? So, you know, in this case, uh, you know, if you're selling this WeChat terminal to a bank, you're not talking about satellites, you're talking about... Uh, you know, where is, uh, what is the availability of the, of the service uh, for such connectivity? Are you uh, able to, you know, keep up 99.99% of availability so that even if people walk in in the middle of the night at, uh, you know, four o'clock in the night uh, and enter an ATM, they should still be able to draw money out. And it's not like, you know, you enter the ATM in five minutes, the, internet, the electricity is out or something like that. And, you know, some sort of connectivity is out or some cable is run through on the ground and, you know, the connectivity is gone, right? So we often uh, expect as consumers that when we go to an ATM machine, you put your money in, you're looking for that money the next second, right? So uh, in that case, you know, you're not really selling a satellite itself. You're actually serving a service on the ground to a consumer or to a, a, a business. So there are many things that you can do. You know, today there are people who are, for example, selling uh, uh, connectivity of uh, fishing boats to fishermen in India, for example, right? So fishermen who go out, they don't have any connectivity on the boats. You know, uh, cell towers don't really extend to the ocean. So you can't really build uh, cell phone towers on the ocean. So they don't really have connectivity on their cell phones. So one of the things that people are trying to sell is, uh, you know, connectivity for their fishing boats so that they know that uh, they are in a safe location. They get weather updates, you know, things like that. They are safe and uh, they know where to go and get some fish and things like that. Right. So there are many uh, places in which you can plug yourself as a salesperson at the end. So it's a question of, you know, what do you want to do? If you want to go do some technical sales, you know, that's where you actually need to know, uh, so, you know, about how satellites work or how rockets work or things like that. But if you are, you know, doing sales in this sort of an environment, you're, you're really facing a consumer or facing a business problem directly. There, you don't really need to know, for example, you know, how a satellite works and, you know, what would a particular component cost and things like that. Um. Yes, that, Abhiram. that was a really great question from Abhiram, actually. Uh, next up, we have Isha. Excuse me, can, uh, I just have a follow-up question. Uh, small. Yes, okay. yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, while you were speaking to Shravani, you spoke about a few projects. What kind of project were you talking about? Can you please give me some insight about it? Sure. So, um, you know, for example, um, today there are a lot of... Uh, you know, uh, PCB, uh, you know, designing uh, software tools. If you are some, somebody who's interested in electronics, for example, and you can design your own uh, PCBs or, you know, you can use even use uh, commercial PCBs like uh, that are ready-made, uh, you know, small computers that are very low cost, like Arduinos or Raspberry Pis. I don't know if somebody, ha some of you have heard about it. And you can do very interesting projects, right? So, I mean, what does a satellite really do? Let's take an example, right? So, you know, a satellite that is built by ISRO, for example, uh, it takes images, let's say, and they just put a camera on a satellite and they take images. So, you know, can you actually emulate that? Um, and, you know, there's a wireless connection, right? Because the images are taken and then they're returned to the ground. There's no wire connecting the satellite to the ground. And so if you want to emulate that as a student, how can you actually do it in a very low cost setting is an interesting question, right? So you can as well use a very small camera, kind of a camera module, you know, camera modules are available for even 50 rupees, 100 rupees nowadays. Uh, you can use a commercial off the shelf uh, you know, a uh, uh, processing board, a processor board that is very low cost. You can use, uh, you know, an RF uh, front end and back end, you know, that is again, very low cost. You can actually program that whole thing to actually, you know, uh, click an image, uh, for example, and you can, you know, down download that onto your computer in a wireless fashion. And, you know, that takes uh, some technical knowledge to actually be able to do that. And essentially you are kind of, 
stimulating the environment that, uh, you know, bigger satellites do in bigger environments and, you know, with higher reliability and things like that. But essentially, you have broken down that big problem uh, that typically big satellites do into a smaller problem that can be done in a smaller team and uh, at a smaller cost and things like that, right? So, you know, this is uh, an example, for example, where, uh, and it's the same with uh, rockets. For example, you can go design model rockets, you know, you can uh, build model rockets in less than 5,000 rupees easily. Uh, in a country like India, and you can do many experiments with it. So if somebody or some of you are really interested in chemistry and, you know, propulsion and uh, rocketry, you can start, uh, you know, designing your own model rockets. You can experiment with all the designs, all the fuels, uh, you know, many things, and it doesn't really cost uh, a lot of money. So, I mean, for me, uh, when I say these are hands-on projects, I mean extremely low-cost uh, projects, you know, the things that don't cost in lakhs of rupees where you have to go borrow money from your parents and so on but you know small uh, small projects that cost uh, less amount of money but you can actually learn quite a lot uh, from it and there is a uh, quite a steep technical challenge that you have to solve to get it done yes thanks sir. Sir. thank you sir thank you yeah. it thank was really you, helpful yeah thank you yeah. Abram, for coming yeah. and asking me questions and thank you sir for uh, answering them well uh, next up is isha and well, go ahead isha the stage is yours Hello, sir. Hi. Uh, sir, uh, my question is related to space debris, actually. Uh, as we know, since one satellite can see half of the Earth, so why do we need more than two satellites in a given network? Will it not uh, cause a space debris in future? So what precautions do the space entrepreneurs uh, took uh, to avoid this problem? Right. So, uh, as uh, you know, uh, when you go higher up into space uh, from away from the Earth, the more higher up that you go, the more of the Earth you can see. Right. Because, um, you know, many of you might know that uh, the geostationary orbit is very popular. Right. It's at uh, 36,000 kilometers. And the reason why it is popular is because from there, you can see a very large area. Like, for example, with one satellite in the geostationary belt, uh, the movement of the satellite, because, you know, the satellites are also moving in its orbit and the Earth is rotating. In the geostationary orbit, the satellite moves at the same pace that the Earth rotates. So, which means that, you know, if I am in Bangalore and I have a satellite up uh, at 36,000 kilometers, uh, you know, the movement of the Earth, the rotation of the Earth is equivalent to the speed at which the satellite is moving in its orbit. So uh, relatively, we are in the same position, right? So, but then when you start coming closer to the Earth, like, you know, maybe 500 kilometers, uh, you're, you're going too fast. You know, the, the satellite is going at seven kilometers per second, and the Earth is not rotating at that faster pace. So which means that you will complete one rotation of the Earth in like 90 minutes. So, you know, obviously you cannot uh, cover the entire Earth with one satellite then, right? So you can cover uh, three si with three satellites in three different 120-degree uh, orbits. For example, you can cover the entire globe with, uh, you know, satellite that is sitting in 36,000 kilometers. But if you want to cover, uh, you know, uh, image the Earth, for example, then, you know, it's not really possible from there, right? So you can't get very high-resolution images from there. So that's where you know you have people flying satellites at 400 500 kilometers but if you want to cover a lot of the earth then you need multiple of them and that's why people fly multiple satellites it's the same with uh, you know broadband connectivity so today you know if uh, we're using discord right this is used by a lot of gamers and gamers care, you know care, they care a lot about uh, latency you know they they want as high latency as possible you know 5 uh, milliseconds or things like that crazy numbers right so uh, you know for example if you want to do a phone call uh, using a, a geostationary satellite uh, it takes a long time because uh, the signal has to go from the earth to 36000 kilometers and back right and it even though if it is the signal is traveling at light speed for example uh, it still takes some time and you can actually notice that lag uh, in it. And so imagine, you know, being a gamer where the signal goes from your computer and then goes into a satellite that is 36,000 kilometers away and comes back, right? So the latency comes, can be something like 200 milliseconds, 
right so which means that if you are playing a first person you know first person uh, shooting game like counter strike or something like that yeah, you are surely dead by the time uh, you know something happens uh, next right so uh, essentially you know this is also the reason why people have satellites in lower orbits today uh, because you know the closer the satellites are to the earth uh, which is you know 500 kilometers or 1000 kilometers the latency can reduce so the signal from your uh, server and then to the satellite can be much smaller the length the uh, that the signal has to travel will be much smaller so the latency is more like uh, you know 50 milliseconds instead of 200 or you know something like that right so you it's much more sane uh, in that fashion and you can do a lot of uh, interesting things with that sort of a thing so that is why you know people have uh, more satellites uh, nowadays in uh, lower orbits uh, and as far as uh, space uh, debris is concerned you know as i already mentioned previously uh, this is uh, uh, this is similar to you know india opening up uh, 100 new airports in the last 10 years uh, where aircrafts are flying there for the first time you know cities like mysore and belgaum and others in karnataka for example where i live uh, are all new. It was not uh, present before. So they're learning how to operate these airports and, you know, how do you make sure that flights are safe, uh, even though there is a lot of traffic up in the air above our uh, head. And that's what, we, you know, most people are trying to, you know, do with space satellites as well. So it's a very evolving phenomena, the space traffic management. So if some of you are really interested in that topic, you know, it's, uh, it's a sector that will see a lot of growth in the next, you know, five to 10 years. So it may be a very interesting area for many of you to also, you know, build some technical capabilities uh, to join in. Uh, I hope yeah, it's... thank you so much. Sir. I'm very, very satisfied. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you, Isha, for uh, coming and asking a uh, very nice question. Uh, and thank you so for an insightful answer. I guess uh, it's time so we can end the session now. But before we do that, there, there's been a question in the chat and it was asked by someone. Uh, the question was, sir, why create a production line for the SpaceX Starship? Asked by K9 Atomic. Uh, say that again, repeat the question. Why create a production line for the SpaceX Starship? Okay, why create a production line? So, yeah, I mean, um, uh, about uh, five years ago, I actually had, uh, you know, the pleasure of actually going uh, to SpaceX uh, for their to their factory. And, uh, you know, I spent a day there uh, with some of their team members. And uh, I also happened to see some of their uh, production line and, you know, how they actually build engines and rockets uh, when I was there. So... Uh, it's a very interesting uh, phenomena that uh, they are trying, right? So, uh, you know, in uh, in in rockets, uh, the bigger the rocket, the lesser the cost per kilogram, and that's how you know uh, you make space transportation cheap. So the reason why you know uh, you know SpaceX built from you know went very quickly from Falcon One to Falcon Nine, and then to Falcon Heavy, and you know to you know whatever Starship and others is. Um, the more bigger rockets that you build, uh, the cheaper the cost becomes, right? So obviously, you know, that is one reason. And the second is uh, volume production, right? So as we know, you know, if you want to make one car, it's, it's going to cost you a lot of money. And uh, if you build, you know, uh, 100,000 cars, you can have them on an assembly line and you can build one car, you know, at a cheaper price because you're buying everything in bulk. Right. So you can negotiate with your suppliers. We can negotiate with a lot of people and you can build it in, in bulk and you can build it cheap. Right. So this is what the automotive sector does with the assembly line uh, system. So interestingly, you know, um, one of my uh, people who were giving me a tour there mentioned to me that uh, SpaceX has actually employed uh, uh, somebody from the automotive automotive industry. Actually, somebody from Mini Cooper, the car company, um, to head their uh, you know, assembly line uh, development and how to actually design design their assembly line. And, uh, you know, they're really using the philosophy of uh, uh, how our automotives produced and uh, bringing that to the space sector, right? Organizing uh, the design and development of engines and, you know, uh, the body of rockets and other things uh, to be, you know, take inspiration from the automotive segment to mass produce uh, rockets. 
so essentially you know this is how you actually reduce the uh, overall cost of uh, of how much people want to pay to get to space right so you know just as an example um, about uh, 15 20 years ago if you wanted to fly 1 kilogram of something right 1 kilogram of chips for example right so if you want to fly fly 1 kilogram of lace chips into space it's going to co it's, it costed something like $100,000 or you know more than that you know $150,000 you know that's like uh, it's an insane number, right? So it's like uh, 1.2 crores Indian rupees per kilogram you're talking about, right? So it's, uh, and today, you know, the, 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 the rocket that SpaceX has, you know, it's uh, closer to $5,000. So you're uh, talking about, uh, you know, almost a 30 times price decrease because of a bigger rocket, a reusable rocket and all of these things, right? Uh, so further, you know, what, what can happen Starship is uh, maybe it's an order of magnitude lower, right? So it might be that Starship is successful, and uh, you know we've uh, we've seen a company like SpaceX reduce the cost of access to space, uh, you know, so to something like uh, five hundred dollars per uh, per kilogram, right? So that might be uh, really really uh, interesting. So with the uh, with new possibilities because, you know, that might allow uh, new people to come up and experiment more in space because the cost of putting something in space becomes so cheap, right? So it can even even help students to send something, right? Because if it is $500, you know, a university can sponsor some students to put something into space versus, you know, something like $100,000. You know, it, not many universities in the world can afford, uh, you know, 70 lakhs to send one kilogram into space. But, you know, if it is something like $500, you know, it opens up new possibilities for even smaller countries, smaller universities, smaller, you know, uh, institutions, startups, all of these people, right? So this is where, you know, it gets very, very interesting. Um, well, I, I hope that answered your question, K9 and Atomic. Uh, they also have another question, and it is, why, why have no reusable launch technologies been developed yet? Uh, why haven't what? I haven't. Why have no reusable launch technologies have been developed? Um, I mean, there are reusable launch technologies developed. Uh, you know, companies like uh, uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin are already doing it. So you know that uh, SpaceX does uh, bring back uh, its you know stages. Uh, it brings back the first stage back uh for use and you know blue origin does the same thing and you know, many other companies are experimenting with it well uh that's guys uh since we are on a time crunch uh that's it for tonight and i hope you all guys everyone liked it and currently space week is going on so the astronomy astronomy squad club of blue Learn is organizing events every single day from the 4th of october to the 10th so we guys invite you to go to the roles and take the astronomy squad role and yes be there and stay tuned for much more events and thank you sir for the for your time and for being patient with us and answering all our questions so insightfully and we are very happy and glad you are here tonight yeah, and, we, and we look forward to more events with you and in case anyone else wants to discuss the questions which we couldn't take up today because of the time limit, you can discuss that in the astronomy chat too with each other or you can ping the, so some of the staff members. Yes, sure. Come in the astronomy channel and there you can ask and we have, much, very, uh, we have people who can answer your questions. You yeah. can also me or Shishijan, any one of us. Okay, so I think we should end this time. Yes, thank you sir again for coming. And we hope we have more events with you. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me and uh, good luck to all of you. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.